All right, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to come speak. Um, it's, it's really great to be back in Toronto to see uh, friends old and new. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about a complexity theory for the quantum age. And this is an age where you know, people will be routinely performing sophisticated quantum experiments. Um, hopefully, quantum computers will be commonplace. And uh, you know, we're starting to enter this era. Um, but uh, you know, as, as we enter this era, this subject of quantum complexity theory, which I won't assume people uh, know much about, um, it's going to start shifting its focus uh, to problems that are more inspired by uh, the types of things that experimentalists and physicists perform in the lab. Um, so then um, that's why I'm particularly excited to, to give this talk here because I want to get your input and thoughts and feedback. Um, and, and the goal of this uh, uh, talk is to really share some of the, the fascinating directions and questions that arise in, 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 these new, uh, in this new complexity theory. So um, let's start from the very beginning. Um, so from the very beginning, uh, this, this quest to build quantum computers and, and quantum computing devices has been deeply rooted in, in something called computational complexity theory, uh, which is the study of what can and cannot be efficiently computed. Right? If you look at uh, you know, the motivation that led um, people like Feynman and Deutsch and, and others to start investigating th this concept of quantum computers, it's this notion that um, quantum computers can solve problems much uh, more efficiently or certain problems uh, than uh, on, a, on a classical computer, right? So quantum computers really change this notion of efficient computability, which is really the subject of, of computational complexity theory, right? Um, you know, and they were motivated by things like uh, problems like simulating quantum physics, factoring, um, uh, you know, boson sampling, and, and so on, right? So to go into a little more detail, um, you know, up till today, you know, if you're a quantum complexity theorist like myself, um, really the types of problems that you're solving uh, are, are the following. So you're studying models of quantum computation uh, where they solve problems with classical inputs and outputs. Okay. So common example is uh, the problem factoring, right? Uh, factoring has a classical input, which is an integer n and a classical output, which is its prime factorization. Um, but you hopefully want to solve this on a, on a quantum computer, right? Here's another example, random circuit sampling. Right, this is a problem that's gotten very popular because of these quantum supremacy experiments um, performed by Google and, and others, right? So again, here we have a classical input, which is a description of a quantum circuit, call it C. And the output is a classical bit string, which is a sample from this distribution, the output distribution of this quantum circuit. Um, here's another example, you know, solving for quantum dynamics, at least the way that it's typically formulated in quantum complexity theory um, is, you know, you get as input a description of a local Hamiltonian, um, you know, some length of time t, a local observable, and the output is, again, a number, right? Uh, so it's, in, you know, the estimate of this observable. This happens to be a BQP complete problem, meaning that this is sort of the, the um, you know, if you can solve this uh, problem, uh, then you can solve any other problem that a quantum computer can solve efficiently. And, uh, you know, let me uh, give this final example, which is the ground energy problem. Right here, again, you get as input a description of a local Hamiltonian. And the output is you want an estimate of the ground energy of this Hamiltonian. Okay, classical input, classical output. And uh, this last one happens to be what's called QMA complete. And I'll get back to this um, concept of QMA completeness in, in a little bit. But for now, just if you don't know what it is, it, it's sort of like the uh, quantum analog of an NP complete problem. Okay, so this, this is sort of like uh, an illustration of what quantum complexity theory looks like, types of problems that you would solve. Um, and this is, you know, this is really useful to consider problems like these because it gives you a, a sort of a, a fair way of comparing classical computers versus quantum computers, right? Um, you know, you can talk about solving these problems on a classical computer. I mean, it seems like it would take much more time and memory to solve these problems, but it's, it still makes sense, right? Um, okay. But um, there's a lot of tasks that don't fit in this framework, right, of classical input, classical output. 
right? In this quantum age, when we're, you know, everyone has a quantum computer and we're sending quantum information back and forth from each other, um, there's other tasks that you can imagine uh, solving or performing. So here's some examples. Um, how about ground state preparation? Right, so this is a problem where you get a classical input, which is a description of a local Hamiltonian, but then the output of the problem is a quantum state. Okay, it's not a string, it's, it's not a number, it's, it's some collection of particles which could be highly entangled. Um, here's maybe the reverse problem, state tomography. You get a quantum input, which is copies of some quantum state, uh, and the output should be some classical description of, of the, the input state. Or maybe you want to perform error correction, which is a problem where you get quantum inputs and quantum outputs, right? You get a noisy quantum code word, uh, and you want to output maybe a cleaned up version of, of this uh, quantum code word, right? Or maybe something more exotic, um, something that you know the, uh, the high energy physicists and the quantum gravity folks are really excited about. Um, you know, you think about using a quantum computer to decode the Hawking radiation from a black hole, right? So this is very exotic, maybe something we, we don't expect to perform anytime soon, um, but this is an example of a task where you get a quantum input, which is you know, this, this Hawking radiation from, from a black hole, and the quantum output is you know, a distillation of some entanglement. So you know, these are really interesting problems from you know, all sorts of uh, different areas of, of physics um, and, and quantum information theory. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see that it doesn't make sense to talk about a classical computer trying to solve these, right? It's just like the format doesn't, um, you know, doesn't fit. Um, but, you know, these are natural problems. And, you know, so a natural question is, what is the computational complexity of performing these tasks? Okay. And currently, it's kind of awkward to talk about these tasks or to study them in, in quantum complexity theory. And the reason is that most of the techniques that we use today um, come from classical complexity theory, right? Which is this subject that's been studied for you know um, over 50 years now, um, you know. And there's a certain way of organizing and classifying problems into these complexity classes that you've probably heard of, uh, maybe in passing, like BQP, QMA, PNP. Um, but these are all defined in terms of classical input and output tasks. And so far, we don't really have a a natural language to formulate the, the types of problems I just mentioned in the previous slide. Right? So, you know, it'd be really useful to develop some kind of inherently quantum complexity theory where the complexity of these tasks like error correction or ground state preparation or decoding, you know, Hawking radiation from a black hole, all of these tasks can be naturally formulated and the relationships between these problems can uh, be formally studied. So, you know, we don't have such a theory yet, but, um, you know, for the rest of this talk, I want to kind of sketch uh, what are uh, some aspects or facets of, of what this theory might look like. Okay, so, so here's, you know, here's like a wish list or, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, what are the goals that this new complexity theory should, uh, should aim for. So, you know, the first thing is, well, you know, when we want to identify natural quantum tasks. Um, you know, things like what I mentioned, state preparation, state transformations um, that naturally occur in the sciences, right? Chemistry, physics, um, you know, computer science, cryptography, optimizations, you know, you name it. Right? So, you, you know, you identify all these problems that naturally show up that, you know, people care about for different reasons. And uh, as a computer scientist, the, you know, one of the first things you want to do is say, well, what ties all these problems together? Can we show reductions between them? You know, if you can solve one problem efficiently, does that mean you can solve this completely seemingly unrelated problem also efficiently, right? Um, you want to classify them according to the computational resources needed. Um, you want to identify complete problems um, and, you know, uh, hopefully prove separations. You know, you want to show that solving this problem is provably much harder than solving this other problem, right? This is sort of the, the bread and butter of, of what a complexity theorist does. And, you know, I'm not the first to sort of suggest this, uh, that we should look at these types of questions and problems. Um, you know, there's, there's many papers studying um, these types of questions in isolation, and, you know, they, they make interesting, uh, prove interesting theorems, maybe even suggest interesting experiments and so on. Um, but they're all kind of scattered about and, and not really connected, and there's no overarching theory to connect them together. Um, and uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about is inspired by um, 
a course that Scott Aronson taught uh, in Barbados uh, in like 2016 or something. And um, uh, out of this workshop came uh, the, the famous Barbados notes. If you haven't seen this, uh, I highly recommend uh, taking a look. Um, it's extremely interesting and highly readable. And the title of this course is The Complexity of Quantum States and Transformations from Quantum Money to Black Holes. So he talks about a lot of the, the problems and themes that you know, I'll be uh, going over, but you know, still there's no presentation of like a coherent or cohesive theory to, to tie everything together. Uh, more recently, uh, Dorita Harnov, uh, Jordan Kotler, and Xiaoling Chi recently proposed a framework called quantum algorithmic measurement. Um, and you know, their motivation was to study the computational complexity of, of quantum physics experiments. So again, you know, they're really thinking along the same lines and you know, just making baby steps towards identifying the questions and the framework here. Um, and you know, we don't have this cohesive theory yet because we're just starting to realize what the questions are. Um, and again, you know, here's where I'm, uh, I'm hoping to hear more from you and you know, get your ideas and, and uh, suggestions. Um, so, you know, this talk are, is, is going to be a bunch of illustrations of recurring themes in, in this uh, nascent theory. Okay. So the first theme that I'll um, talk about, is something called a search to decision reductions in the quantum world. So what does this mean? Um, so let's talk about search versus decision problems. So in computer science, there's... Um, you know, we often consider two types of computational problems. One is a decision problem, which is problems that have yes or no answers. And we also consider search problems, uh, which are problems where, you know, the answer you're looking for is some longer thing. It's not just a yes or no answer. It's a longer, say, string that satisfies some criteria. So here's an example. You know, let's uh, think about solving a system of linear equations. You're given a matrix A and a vector B, and, um, you know, you want to solve it. So the decision version uh, of this problem is you just want to know, does there exist a solution X that satisfies this linear equation or in this system? Okay, so there's a yes or no answer. Either there is or you know, either there isn't. Um, the search problem is to actually find a vector X that uh, satisfies uh, AX equals B if it exists. Okay. So there, these are two types of problems that you might want to solve. Um, and a useful fact that is used over and over again in, in classical computer science is that really we kind of blur our eyes and don't really consider the distinction, even though they, they seem like different things. Um, and that's because search problems are often reducible to decision problems. So, you know, here's a canonical example of this. If you can efficiently decide NP-complete problems, okay, you know, meaning you can efficiently answer the yes or no question, then you can also efficiently search for solutions for them. And in, in you know, computer science lingo, this means there are efficient search to decision reductions for NP. Okay. And like I said, this, because of this, this often justifies our, our, uh, you know, us blurring the distinction between search and decision problems. You know, we don't really um, uh, you know, consider the difference that often. So to, to make this really concrete, let's go over this search to decision reduction for, for SAT, which is an NP complete problem, right? So, you know, let's imagine that we have Mickey Mouse here and, you know, he wants to solve this NP complete problem, which is to decide whether there exists an assignment to the variables X1 up to XN that satisfies this SAT formula phi. So Mickey Mouse isn't able to solve this on his own. It's a, it's a hard problem, but let's say he has a, uh, access to this decision oracle. So this is an all-knowing, all-powerful oracle where, you know, you feed in uh, a SAT instance, a SAT formula, and it will tell you yes or no, does it uh, have a solution? Okay. So, you know, how does Mickey Mouse go about using this oracle to find a specific solution, you know, to solving the search problem? Well, first he's going to say, well, is there a solution to begin with? He's going to ask this oracle. So he makes a query, does there exist x1 up to xn that satisfies phi? And let's say the Oracle says, yes, there is. And then Mickey Mouse says, okay, great. Let's, let's find a solution then. It's out there somewhere. So what does Mickey Mouse do next? Well, it's gonna say, is there a solution where X1 is set to zero? Is there a way of completing um, you know, the rest of the variable so that this, this uh, formula is, is still equal to one? 
And maybe the oracle says, no, there isn't. Okay. And then from this, Mickey Mouse can conclude that you know, it can set x1 equals to 1. There must be a valid solution uh, where you can complete uh, you know, the first bit set to 1. All right, so you just proceed in this way. You know, Mickey Mouse will say, OK, what about x2 equals to 0? Uh, decision oracle says yes. And you know, Mickey Mouse continues in this way, bit by bit, building up a solution. And um, in a linear number of steps, linear in the number of variables, Mickey Mouse will eventually construct a solution uh, for this uh, you know, SAT formula. Okay. So this is pretty intuitive. And this is what I mean by a search to decision reduction. We're using a decision oracle to solve this search problem. Um, and you know, this is used all over the place in computer science. Um, it's basic, but, but important. OK, what about the quantum analog of this question? Right? So is there an analogous reduction for QMA? I mentioned that QMA is a quantum analog of NP. The complete problem for QMA is the following. Suppose I give you a description of a local Hamiltonian H, and I want you to tell me, is the ground energy of H less than alpha or greater than beta? Um, so this is a decision problem. And um, there's actually a couple ways that you can interpret this question, like what, what is a search to decision reduction? One is, if I give you an oracle for deciding uh, between you know, the less than alpha or greater than beta question, can you actually approximate the numerical value of the ground energy? All right, so that's one version. And using similar ideas to the, the Mickey Mouse strategy, um, you can. Okay. So you, know, you can sort of home in on what the, the um, ground energy should approximately be. Um, but the more interesting version of this question is the following. Um, suppose you get access to this ground energy oracle, right? which would be great. You know, it's a hard problem to solve, but let's say I give you access to it so it can answer these yes or no questions. Can you use this to efficiently prepare a ground state uh, to um, uh, your favorite local Hamiltonian? Right? Like actually prepare in the lab. So this is a quantum search task, right? So here you're, you get a classical input which is a description of a local Hamiltonian, and the output is, is a ground state. It's a quantum state. And uh, you know, in, in this Mickey Mouse picture, you know, he wants to talk to this ground energy oracle. Maybe he comes up with some other Hamiltonian H prime. Um, it you know, gets some uh, you know, estimate of the ground energy, say. Um, and and you know, querying this a bunch of times, is it possible to use this information in some fashion uh, to run his equipment and, and actually build the, a ground state of, of the original Hamiltonian H. Right. It'd be really interesting if this was possible, uh, but we, we actually don't know how to do this. Okay. And um, there's a difficulty in trying to uh, adapt the classical strategy. Right? So you know, the, the big barrier here is that um, uh, because of entanglement. Right? Ground states of local Hamiltonians can be highly entangled. And so you can't prepare ground states just by solving for each qubit individually and concatenating them together, right? A lot of the information in, in this ground state is contained in the entanglement between the particles. Um, so this sort of uh, you know, bit by bit fixing doesn't, uh, strategy doesn't work. Right? So you know, an example of such a Hamiltonian could be like the toric code Hamiltonian, right? Ground states of this Hamiltonian are code words of a quantum error correcting code. And if you take any of these ground states and look at any individual qubit, you're just going to see the maximally mixed qubit, right? There's absolutely no information whatsoever. It's all contained in the correlations between the particles. Um, so, you know, that, that's sort of a, a major barrier to ad adapting this search to decision reduction. Um, but then you might say, okay, maybe there's some other clever way of um, using this ground energy oracle to build up these, these ground states. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't seem possible. And, and, um, and in this recent work with uh, Arani, Rao, Natarajan, and Nurke, we, we give some formal evidence um, that this isn't possible, that there is no way, uh, a clever way of, of uh, using this ground energy oracle to build ground states. So the, more formally, we say that there's no efficient way to reduce QMA search problems to QMA decision problems relative to an oracle. This last thing relative to an oracle is, uh, uh, means something in, in complexity theory, which is it's not related to the ground energy oracle. Um, this last thing is, uh, is sort of complexity speak 
um, or so the complexity equivalent of the spherical cow approximation that's used in, in physics. Okay, so you know, actually studying these complexity classes like NP and QMA is really difficult, right? You know, there's a reason why the P versus NP question is so hard and it's still open. Uh, it's because, you know, it's really hard to, to get a, um, you know, precise grasp on these complexity classes. So falling short of that, what complexity theorists often try to do is uh, try to make some, you know, approximations just like people do in physics. And so here we approximate QMA as the, a class of generic uh, quantum search problems. What I mean by this is we sort of approximate it, you know, solving a QMA complete problem is, is like you're trying to identify, does there exist a generically entangled state, um, you know, that's a, a ground state of a local Hamiltonian. I mean, this is not what reality is, but it's, it's a useful approximation and, you know, we can learn a lot by, by making it. So that's what relative to an oracle means. Um, and it's, it sort of gives us evidence that there is no um, search to decision reduction for uh, for the local Hamiltonian problem. Um, and one implication that we can draw from this result that I mentioned is that if local Hamiltonians actually does have a search to decision reduction, right? We didn't rule it out completely. We just show that there's evidence there isn't. But if there actually exists one, then it cannot be a generic reduction that works for all QMA complete problems. And this is something that's very different from the classical world because this Mickey Mouse strategy of fixing the solution bit by bit, this is something that's generic, right? It didn't really matter that we were talking about SAT or some other NP-complete problem. You know, you can use it for, for any NP-complete problem. But here, if there is one, this, you know, uh, this search to decision reduction, it really has to use some special structure of the local Hamiltonian problem. So, um, you know, that's one implication. Okay. Um, so, uh, all right, so you know, maybe there doesn't exist one, um, but you can still ask, you know, is there some decision oracle of some complexity? Maybe it's not a ground energy oracle. Uh, maybe it's harder than a QMA complete problem that's helpful for preparing ground states. And we show that there actually is one, um, and you just have to go slightly beyond QMA. You have to invoke the power of this complexity class called uh, PP, which stands for probabilistically a probabilistic polynomial time. And um, it's actually an extremely powerful complexity class. It contains lots of difficult problems, you know, P, NP, QMA. Um, actually, there's a quantum characterization, which is that it's equivalent to all the problems that you can solve using post selection on a quantum computer. Okay, so it's a big class of problems. If you can solve problems in here, you can solve the decision problems uh, in, in this class, then you can efficiently prepare ground states. So, so that's one complexity theoretic um, result that, that we obtain. Okay. Um, so really the, the, you know, the upshot here is that, um, you know, all of this is to suggest that preparing ground states is somehow seems more complex than just deciding um, or estimating ground energies, right? And so this is kind of a surprise from the complexity theoretic point of view. Maybe in, in the lab you're already familiar with this um, this phenomenon. Um, and, you know, one open question that I'm uh, kind of interested in is, you know, can we turn this question on its head? Let's say I give you a black box oracle where you press a button and it prepares a ground state for you. I mean, that'd be really nice, right? What sorts of problems can you solve if I give you this black box? So it'd be nice to get some sort of characterization uh, of this. Okay, so um, moving on to, um, so that was talking about one theme, which is about search decision reductions and how moving into this quantum world where you're talking about quantum inputs and quantum outputs, things start to, to look different. So here, here's another setting. So here I'll talk about the complexity of, of quantum transformations. So um, to motivate this, I, I want to distinguish this from quantum search problems, which we just saw, where here you're given some implicit classical description of a state, right? By implicit, I mean you're, you're not given the state as like a state vector or anything, but maybe you're given a local Hamiltonian, which implicitly specifies a ground state. Um, but really the input is, um, is classical and, and the output is quantum. A quantum transformation problem is a little more involved. So here you're given implicit classical description of not a state, but a quantum channel, right? Maybe it's a circuit, maybe it's a unitary, 
um, uh, uh, or a channel um, that's really complicated. Um, and you're given a quantum input state, psi, and your goal is to prepare the state which is the application of this channel to the input state. Okay. You want to transform the input state according to this channel. And quantum transformation problems seem um, harder than search problems because there is no classical description, even implicitly, of the desired output, right? The output you're trying to get, which is, you know, this channel E applied to the state psi, right? You, you only have uh, the description of it in quantum form, right? I mean, you have the channel in, uh, as a classical, um, you know, presented classically, but the, the input state psi is, is a quantum state, right? So there's no, like, classical foothold to even describe this output state, yet you're supposed to produce it. Um, so that's why it seems kind of uh, a little harder to, to perform these problems. Um, and I'm going to anchor this discussion uh, with a specific one uh, that I'll call the Ullman transformation problem. And this is based on um, something called Ullman's theorem, which uh, probably many of you know. Um, and a simple version of it is, is the following. Let's say I give you purifications, psi 1 and psi 2 of a density matrix rho. Uh, then there must exist a unitary that relates the purifications uh, to each other where the, uh, the unitary only acts on the purifying um, uh, space uh, of the, the, the two pure states, right? So um, let's say the first register of psi one uh, is, you know, the reduced density matrix is equal to the reduced density matrix of psi two. Um, then there's a unitary acting on the second register that maps psi one to psi two. This is Ullman's theorem. Um, so based on this, I can define the following computational task. So uh, it gets, uh, as uh, input, a classical description of two circuits, C1 and C2. So these generate these purifications of some density matrix row. Right? You're, you're promised that there, there really are purifications of the same thing, um, but they're different pure states. So by Ullman's theorem, you know that there must exist an Ullman transformation that relates the two states together. You know, it's out there somewhere. So your goal is to implement this unitary. So, so this is the Ullman transformation problem. And uh, it might seem a little abstract, like why am I thinking about this problem? Where does it come from? Well, surprisingly, it turns out to be a problem that shows up in a lot of different areas. Um, and it's at the core of things like protocols for entanglement distillation, right? Um, you know, protocols that occur in quantum Shannon theory, like quantum state redistribution, merging, splitting, um, it shows up in uh, something called quantum interactive proofs, which is uh, something that's studied in, in cryptography and in quantum complexity theory. Um, and also in this uh, decoding black hole uh, Hawking radiation problem. Okay. And, and somehow this Ullman transformation problem is central to all of these. And so it, it's, uh, you know, there's good motivation to try to understand what the complexity of this transformation problem is. So um, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to uh, sort of illustrate this by talking about the black hole problem. I mean, because, um, you know, black holes are cool and uh, there's some, I spent a lot of time making these animations. Um, so, so here's a, a summary of the, uh, you, know, the, you know, where does this decoding black hole radiation problem come from? And it comes from thinking about this black hole information paradox, right? So the high level summary is, let's say Alice here has a secret diary that she tosses into a black hole. And, um, you know, they get scrambled up. And then for, you know, the next several, you know, 10 to the 67 billion years, um, this black hole evaporates via Hawking radiation into nothingness. Okay, what happened to, uh, oops, to uh, the secrets in Alice's diary, right? Did it disappear? Is it somewhere, right? This is the black hole information paradox. <clears throat> and, you know, a little more um, precisely, Right? Like Hawking predicted that black holes emit thermal radiation. And what this implies is that a black hole, in principle, can evolve from a pure state into a, a, a mixed state, right? This mixed state being the, the thermal radiation. But this violates the unitarity principle of quantum mechanics. It sort of suggests that there can be some information loss. 
And you know, since he made this prediction, there's been you know, roughly 50 years of vigorous debate about this paradox. Um, uh, but recently, physicists have gotten quite excited by thinking about this problem in terms of quantum information theory and quantum computation. So, so what exactly are they thinking about? Well, here's a, a thought experiment uh, that's, that was proposed by Hayden and Preskill. Um, that's quite interesting to try to get at the heart of what's going on in this uh, information paradox. So um, let's say, you know, we have our scientist Alice here, and she has an entangled pair of particles A and B. Let's say it's a maximally entangled pair of qubits. And uh, also on the side, there's a young black hole. Okay, it was just formed, maybe in, in her lab or something. Um, and let's assume that it's in a pure state omega. So the, the global state of the system is this tripartite state ABC. There's the two entangled particles tensor the black hole. So let's say Alice tosses particle B into the black hole. It disappears, it gets scrambled up inside, something happens. Um, and uh, now Alice just waits. Okay, so over the next 10 to the 67 years, this black hole evaporates into Hawking radiation, okay, according to what people understand about uh, black hole um, dynamics. Um, and so you know, the, out comes this cloud of, of Hawking radiation R, and you know, the black hole shrinks. And let's say um, after a very, very long time, it becomes this old black hole where you know, most of its mass is actually out in the, the Hawking radiation. And um, assuming that the black hole dynamics are unitary, okay, um, and then it's scrambling, okay, which is, uh, I guess, from black hole physics is a very reasonable thing to assume. Uh, if you look at the, the joint state, quantum state of, of uh, everything, Alice's particle A will be unentangled with the old black hole E and, and completely entangled with this radiation R, right? So, you know, we, more formally, let's say we take the initial state, we apply the black hole dynamics, which is this unitary V. And uh, you look at the reduced density matrix um, of Alice's particle A and the old black hole, and you see that they're um, approximately in, in a, a tensor product, right? There's no entanglement between A and E. Okay. So let's consider another purification of, of uh, the reduced density matrix uh, AE. So here's one where I'm going to just uh, purify the particle A into another um, uh, bell pair, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And then I'm going to tensor this with a purification of the old black hole. Let's call it gamma. Okay. So in our hands, we have two purifications of the same thing. We have the true state, which is psi, which is this evolved black hole with the radiation and, and Alice's particle A. And we have this alternative purification. And by Ullman's theorem, there must exist a unitary that acts on the radiation only that transforms one purification to another. So this is where the quantum computation comes in. Let's say Alice has been diligently collecting the Hawking radiation over these many years. Um, and she also has this very powerful quantum computer she dumps the radiation into the quantum computer, then in principle, there is some computation it can perform to transform uh, the global state into this other purification. Okay. And what she, she will have extracted is this other entangled particle of her uh, uh, partner of her particle A. Right? She will have recovered the entanglement. So, you know, this kind of seems difficult, right? Um, and you know, I'm not worried about, okay, what's the difficulty of collecting all this Hawking radiation and actually building the quantum computer and, you know, or setting up this black hole in isolation. I'm not worried about any of that. I mean, it's difficult, yes. But what I really care about is, you know, what is the computational difficulty of actually decoding this Hawking radiation? You know, can it be performed in polynomial time, right? And, um, you know, Hayden, Harlow, and Scott Aronson in, in, in some works showed that actually no, um, that shouldn't be possible unless there are some very su surprising complexity consequences. You know, things like uh, something known as QSEK, uh, which is uh, something from quantum cryptography is contained in BQP, uh, or that quantum computers can invert one-way functions, um, all of which we, we don't expect as computer scientists. Um, and Scott Aronson also asked uh, another question is, what are some of the upper limits on the resources needed to decode 
Hawking radiation, right? So we think it's hard, but just how hard is it, right? Can you give some sort of upper bound? And it's, it hasn't been clear, um, you know, do you need exponential space, exponential memory, exponential time? Um, and so, you know, with some joint work with Tony Mecker, you know, we sort of make a little progress towards this. We actually look at not just this black hole problem, but this more general Ullman transformation problem. And what we show is that, um, yes, it's hard, but, but um, there exists a uniform quantum algorithm that only uses a polynomial number of qubits. So the quantum memory is still efficient, um, and there's a uniform quantum algorithm to actually solve the, the Ullman transformation problem. And so it has, you know, because we, we look at this Ullman transformation problem, it also applies to this black hole problem, um, the quantum interactive proofs, quantum Shannon theory, and, and, and other applications. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one thing we can say uh, about it, which is uh, non-trivial. And uh, so, you know, now I'm out of time, and, and so I'll just uh, wrap up with the summary. Um, so as the field evolves, you know, as quantum complexity theory evolves and quantum computers are starting to be built, um, you know, questions about the complexity of inherently quantum tasks are going to be increasingly important. Um, and, you know, we need a, a complexity theory to, to talk about these tasks and, and to study them. Um, and so in this talk, I gave some emerging facets of what this theory might, might care about. Um, for example, looking at the existence or non-existence of these search to decision reductions, um, looking at uh, this Ullman transformation problem, which seems to be core to many different types of uh, tasks, experimental or, or in, uh, other areas of physics. Um, and there are many open questions that I'm happy to share. Uh, and so with that, uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>